rival General Moise Tshumbe, Lumumba turned to the USSR for support. This meant that the Soviets would now be able to extend their bloc into Africa. This, as far as the agency was concerned, was an unforgivable offence. To the outside world, it appeared as though Lumumba was betrayed to the Tshumbe forces and murdered while in captivity, when in fact, he had been conveniently removed by the CIA to prevent Soviet domination in Africa. The CIA walked away with nothing pointing to their involvement in the death of this revolutionary African leader. I'm not an American. I'm one of the 22 million black people who are the victims of Americanism. And I see America through the eyes of a victim. I don't see any American dream. I see an American nightmare. On February the 21st, 1965, as Malcolm X stood to address a meeting in the Audubon Ballroom in New York City, he was shot in the chest with bullets from a sawn-off shotgun. No evidence directly linked the death of the revolutionary Afro-American Muslim leader to the CIA, but suspicions still persist. The Nation of Islam, by that time, was thoroughly infiltrated. They could not plan a stroll in Central Park, so at at the very least, they were aware of plans to assassinate Brother Malcolm, you know, and did nothing to stop it. At worst, they were the puppeteers. Malcolm's open condemnation of the CIA and US involvement in the Congo made him a target. The day before he was scheduled to address a summit conference of African prime ministers in Cairo, he collapsed with severe stomach pains after eating a meal at his hotel. He now suspected that the agency was out to get him, but still continued his campaign. As rumours of the agency's intentions spread, Malcolm was refused entry into France. A few days before he was shot, his home in Queens was firebombed, a warning sign of what was to the come. The assassination of Malcolm X was an unfortunate tragedy, and it reveals that there are still uh, numerous uh, people in our nation who have degenerated to the point of expressing dissent through murder and uh, we haven't learned to disagree without being violently disagreeable. It was assumed that Malcolm's death was the result of sectarian revenge. The view held by many prominent blacks, however, was that Malcolm's killing was a political act with international implications. Malcolm's successor, Leon Amir, determined to expose the agency, scheduled a press conference during which he was to present evidence pointing to Malcolm's real killers. The next morning, Amir was found dead in Boston's Sherry Biltmore Hotel. The police report stated that he had died of an epileptic fit. Ironically, he had no medical history of epilepsy. Malcolm X had been on the CIA watch list for some time. The timing of the assassination coincided with numerous events, namely his acceptance of orthodox Islam, and moreover his extension of his initial localized policy to one that would call for global unity of African nations. The journey was to Mecca to make myself an authentic Muslim and to give us direct link, direct contact, direct communication and cooperation with our brothers and sisters all over the earth. So the first step that has been taken, brothers and sisters, since Gavi died, to actually establish contact with our African brothers on the African continent. Malcolm X had grown from a local menace to an international voice for the oppressed black man. His power was on the rise, and in a preemptive action, he was silenced. No Negro leaders have fought for civil rights. They have begged the white man for civil rights. They have begged the white man for freedom. And every time, anytime you beg another man to set you free, you will never be free. Freedom is something that you have to do for yourself. And until the American Negro lets the white man know that we are really, really ready and willing to pay the price that is necessary for freedom, our people will always be walking around here second-class citizens or what you call 20th century slaves. What price are you talking about, sir? The price of freedom is death. Another two years later in 1967, Argentinian-born Che Guevara would become one of the agency's major hits. Che with Castro had been a founder of the Cuban Revolution. He had been a thorn in the CIA's side for a long time. After Castro's liberation of Cuba, Che began representing Cuba on many commercial missions. 
He also was renowned in the West for his opposition to all forms of imperialism and neo-colonialism, and for his attacks on US foreign policy. During the early 1960s, he defined Cuba's policies and his own views in many speeches and writings, notably El Socialismo y el Hombre en Cuba. Che was later involved in the Congo with other Cuban guerrilla fighters, helping to organize the Patrice Lumumba Battalion. At the time, there was no person more feared by the company than Che Guevara. He had the capacity and charisma necessary to direct the struggle against the political repression of the traditional hierarchies of power in the countries of Latin America and Africa. In 1967, the notorious CIA agent Felix Rodriguez captured and assassinated Che while he was organizing a guerrilla group in Bolivia. This assassination, however, backfired globally on the agency. Within days of his death, the charismatic leader had become a world icon a martyr for the revolution. He would become the poster boy for the 1960s. His image appeared on t-shirts and posters from New York to Tokyo. Even today, his image is still popular. We will not prematurely or unnecessarily risk the course of worldwide nuclear war in which even the fruits of victory would be ashes in our mouth. But neither will we shrink from that risk at any time it must be faced. Oliver Stone's controversial 1991 movie JFK forced the case to be reopened with some chilling findings. The overwhelming bulk of material published about Kennedy would point to three major suspects the FBI, CIA, and the Mafia. These organizations were the only ones with enough resources and assets to plan and execute the murder of the US president in broad daylight and carry out a cover-up operation that would involve the murder of over 50 people. On its own, the Mafia simply did not have the contacts, clout, and know-how to pull off such an elaborate stunt. They probably acted as backup and helped with some of the cleanup operations. There is also a shadow of doubt about the FBI's active involvement in the murder of Kennedy. FBI directors already had enough evidence of the president's constant womanizing to bring him down without murdering him. The FBI's lack of motivation can lead us to conclude that they, like the Mafia, only assisted in the cleanup. This leaves only the CIA. They had the motive, the means, and the opportunity. The company could not forget Kennedy's refusal to support them during the Bay of Pigs fiasco. In addition, he was also considering pulling the US out of Vietnam and therefore putting a stop to the company's own little war. He also was a sympathizer to the civil rights struggle. However, what topped it all was the fact that he was determined to destroy the company and put an end to its deceptive tactics. This is the BBC Home Service. It is with deep regret that we announce that President Kennedy is dead. President Kennedy was shot in full view of the public during a routine electioneering motorcade in Dallas, Texas. One hour before the shooting, the entire Washington phone system was taken down. The motorcade route was suspiciously changed at the last minute to accommodate his passage through the open area of Dealey Plaza. The Secret Service conveniently neglected carrying out routine checks on windows overlooking the route. To the horror of those watching, the president was killed by shots to the upper body and then a final conclusive shot to the head. According to eyewitnesses and a home video made by Abraham Zapruder, these shots were not fired by a lone gunman. Afterwards, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested within hours of the shooting. Later, while still in police custody, Jack Ruby, a mob cleanup guy, shot Oswald dead. The initial public reaction was that Ruby was a patriotic American. However, these were the actions of a mob silencer. Although Oswald, a Marxist, appeared to be a supporter for Castro, he also maintained relationships with right-wing extremists and known CIA operatives. It had now become clear to the world that Oswald had taken the fall for the agency.
It was General Charles Cabell who changed the motorcade route so that it made the slow, fatal turn past the Texas Book Depository, ultimately luring the president.